Hi, and welcome to the February edition of According to Pete. Uh, we're gonna talk about voltage regulators and why you want them. Uh, I'm gonna show you some circuits that don't work particularly well. Then I'm going to bring in voltage regulators and talk about different kinds. And then we're ultimately going to lead to the ubiquitous LM317. And at the very end, I'm gonna show you a circuit that I've been dealing with uh, for a project of mine. Uh, to kind of illustrate some of the setup of this thing, what you got to watch for, and design stuff. Uh, this is going to be a long one, so let's uh, head it, head, hit it, hit, 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 hit. Start with, uh, let's consider uh, a logic circuit. You got a microcontroller, you're trying to power it with, uh, you know, some voltage. Now the microcontroller is going to want, uh, they, they'll operate within a certain range, like, you know, 2.3 to 3.3 volts, give or take. Um, but if you screw with that voltage supply too much you've got logic levels in there right that are that are ideally pretty stationary well if your supply voltage is doing wiggy stuff that's going to propagate through your logic and so you're going to get an unreliable output of your circuit okay um then there is stuff like ratiometric parts so for example um uh an accelerometer that has an analog output, right? A voltage that, that, that you know, that you'd shake it and you get a certain voltage deflection from, from the norm. Well, um, if your supply voltage changes, that output voltage will change because it's a ratio of the supply voltage. So you gotta have something steady for that. Then there's analog circuits. For analog, anything, any variation that happens on the supply line is going to propagate to your output. So there's a lot of need to have a very stable supply voltage okay now how do you get that let's say for example and, and everybody's looking at this going Pff, oh typical example yes okay voltage divider sure enough if this r and this r are the same you get five volts out given 10 volts in let's say you want to take some current out of that hey, that's my supply right there man and then you attach another load to that so now you know you know about parallel resistance right we talked about that Parallel resistance is um, product over sum. So let's call this R1 and this R2. So the resistance of this now is R1 uh, times R2 over R1 plus R2. You know what? It's less. It's less than it used to be. So what's going to happen there? This is going to start um, drawing more current. And the more current has to go through here, the more voltage drop is across here. So your 5 volts is going to go down. That sucks. Voltage dividers, no good. But here's another way. Um, that is a Zener diode. Just as a refresher, for those of you that don't know, this thing is uh, effectively a diode that operates in reverse bias to the point where the junction actually breaks down. And its characteristic is such that it breaks down at a known voltage. And you can get Zener diodes in all kinds of different voltage ratings. Well, for this case, I've got one. This is a five volt Zener, right? We're gonna call that just right out. Five volt and a squiggly that no one can identify. And this is better, right? You can start drawing some current off of this and this Zener is going to try to maintain that. So it's, it's an improvement over the uh, uh, voltage divider. Here's what's actually happening here. Let's say for example, I put a load on that guy. So now I've got current, right? Before that was, before that was there, I just had like current going Nah. Now I've got current, some current going this way and some current going that way. Because this is a steady voltage, the voltage across this is going to be steady as well. So there's always going to be the same amount of current going through that. That's Ohm's law. So what's actually happening is that as this becomes a smaller resistance, which is to say a greater load, it's drawing more current, what it's going to do is divert current that is already going through the diode to go through the load. In that way, the total circuit current stays constant and the voltage across this resistor stays constant. The problem happens when this load becomes so great, that is it draws so much current that there's none left to keep this thing running, all right? At that point, what happens is the current through the entire circuit will start to increase and the voltage drop across this will start to increase and this voltage will start to decrease. That's one way to look at it. The other way you can look at it is this is this one's sucking so much current out of this that there's not enough current to reverse bias or keep that thing in its regulated state. Eh, it effectively becomes the same thing. That is called um, load regulation. 
okay, for a change in load. And this is, there are a bunch of ways that regulators are, um, they're given specs. Load regulation is one of them, which is to say, uh, for a changing load, uh, how well is this thing able to maintain? Now, in the case of the resistor divider, uh, there was no load regulation. You couldn't change that, that amount of current at all without having the voltage on the load change. Then there's line regulation, right? For the case of the voltage divider, and I've already erased it, but I'm gonna do it again. What the heck? So let's say that this voltage goes up, right? V, increase. Well, the voltage at this point is going to increase because, you know, the, the output is a direct ratio of the input. That's line regulation. This doesn't have it. Now, line regulation for this guy is a little bit better, um, but let's say, let's say for example, that this voltage goes up, okay? Your, your supply voltage goes up, this voltage wants to remain constant, so what happens? Well, you've got more voltage across this resistor here, so that means there's more current going through here. Assuming that load doesn't change, all the extra current has to go through the diode. Where not necessarily the problem, but where a problem comes up is that this thing, this is a five volt diode, okay? It's always got five volts on it, and whatever current is not going through the load is going through that. And if you want this thing to be versatile at all, you gotta have a lot of current going through it in the first place. And that equals power. Voltage times current is power. So this thing, if you're drawing an amp or you want to be able to source an amp, this thing has gotta be better than five watts. Um, in fact, as a rule of thumb, you always double your expected power rating when you're buying parts. This has some difficulties, which leads us to voltage regulators. What does a voltage regulator do? Let's say you've got, you know, the, some black box here, which is your regulator, and it's got an output of some voltage, you know, plus V, we'll say. Or no matter what's going on here, what, what it generally does is is got a resistor divider that goes back to a feedback pin. What it's doing is it's constantly monitoring what it's putting out and what the circuit demand is, right? So if if whatever out here starts drawing more current, um, oh, I hope this works, this is effectively a variable resistance. In the case of our vo uh, voltage divider uh, example beginning when I showed you this doesn't work, okay? The reason it doesn't work is because that one never changes, okay? But with this thing, or with any voltage divider, this, this effectively changes, particularly for a linear. This thing is constantly monitoring the output voltage and reporting back in order to adjust that guy. So let's say, for example, um, the load starts drawing more current, okay? Uh, what happens when you draw more current? Well, the voltage across that guy goes up, right? Ohm's law, man. You start drawing more current, the voltage across this guy is going to go up. So this voltage is going to go down, and consequently this voltage is going to go down. And then it goes, hey man, no, 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 turn it on, turn it on, turn it on. And so this resistance actually becomes smaller, lets through more current, keeps the voltage at a regulated place. There's a couple of different types of regulator that we use around SparkFun. Um, this would be considered uh, a linear design, which is what we're working towards, the LM317, and there's a lot of different kinds of linear regulators. Um, the other kind that we typically use is a switching regulator, okay? Now, for a switching regulator, it does not use a resistor, it uses an inductor to keep a continuous current flow out, right? An inductor, if you remember, an inductor stores energy by means of a magnetic field, okay? When you put current through the inductor, the field expands and that's energy. When current stops, the field contracts and it pushes the juice back out. So in that way, it doesn't lose power. It's a very efficient design. This thing, not so good. That's a resistor, okay? So you've got a voltage in and you've got a voltage out. So how much power is this thing going to dissipate? Well, it's gonna, you know, V, uh, v in minus V out uh, times current. And oftentimes that is not negligible. Um, and that's when we go to a switching regulator. But a lot of times, most times, you can get away with a linear. They're quiet, they're cheap, they're simple to use. Uh, and so we use a lot of them. Now I've drawn an LM317 circuit up here. Bear with me for a second. Um, there, are, there are probably a zillion different kinds of linear voltage regulators, but there are two that you're likely to run into uh, without trying very hard. Uh, one is an adjustable 
and one is a fixed, right? So the LM7805 is a fixed regulator. Now, what does that mean? It means uh, in, instead of having to do this nonsense on the outside, this nonsense is on the inside. And um, you just give it a V in and a ground and an out, and it makes five bolts out of such and such. Here's an LM317 in its natural habitat. How do you set this guy up? The equation for the V out is given as, and, and I'm, I'll, I'll go over this, uh, so 1.25 volt times 1 plus R2 over R1, that being R2, that being R1, plus I adjust, which is the current coming out of the adjust pin, times R2. And V ref is 1.25 volts. What it's going to try to do is maintain 1.25 volts between the output pin and the adjust pin. A, D, J. I know you can't read it, but I said it, so you have to remember it now. So what this thing is going to do is set up a bias current that goes nah, 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 like yay. But also, there's this I adjust, and this is all coming from the equation, right? But this is also general function, so I want you to kind of visualize how this happens. There's also an I adjust that comes out of the adjust pin. That is given in the data sheet to be around 50 microamps. That looks like an H. Okay, so there's, there's generally 50 microamps going through here. Oftentimes, we just ignore that current, right? Because it's, it's, you know, when you're setting up something that's like a couple orders of magnitude higher, there's not going to be a lot of difference. But some, in some applications, you really need this thing to be precise, and you need to calculate it just like that. How much does this current need to be? Minimum load. This is also given the data sheet. Uh, this is also called quiescent current. For this device to be stable and, and regulating properly, you have to be drawing anywhere from 3.5 to 10 milliamps, and it'll depend on the exact part, what that minimum is. So generally, you will want to be drawing enough current to guarantee that this thing is always going to be stable. And in the data sheet, they, they'll even go as far as to specify 240 ohms here and whatever else here to get your output voltage. I never, because I'm a bad engineer, I never, I never bother with this equation. I always go, okay, so the reference is 1.25 volts, and I know, if I know my V out, and I know that this voltage is um, 1.25 volt, volts less than that, I know how much current is running through there. And I know that this voltage is, you know, this minus 1.25 times that current that I already know. So I can immediately calculate R2. Blam! Blam! That's probably the long way around, but that's the way I kind of see the circuit in my head. Something else you need to know, uh, V drop, um, what that is, is drop out voltage. In order for this thing to run right, there has to be at least some amount of voltage across the device. And it's specified in the data sheet, and it's 1.75 volts, absolute minimum, right? So if I want five volts out, this has gotta be running at 6.75 volts at the very least. If it drops any more than that, I can expect wigginess on the output, okay? But for voltages higher, it's pretty good. Good line regulation. And because it's a feedback network, it's got pretty good load regulation. Couple of uh, design considerations that are sort of off the top of my head while I'm looking at this circuit. They very much like when you decouple the adjust pin. And the data sheet, depending on the data sheet and the manufacturer that you're looking at, um, they will say you can decouple this up to like 10 microfarad, and more than that is kind of stupid. Oftentimes you'll see like a 0.1 or something, and that's sufficient. And that's just to improve uh, ripple rejection so you don't get more junk on the output. They also like to see protection diodes, right? So so when when this thing turns off, okay, and, and let's say you've got a cap out here. Um, you know, your filter cap on the output and you can put one up here sometimes. When V in goes zero, when you turn this thing off, right, this cap and this cap have to discharge in a way that will not destroy. <laughs> I, I laughed just saying it. Really? I did discharge? I destroy the cap? Yeah, it's going to wreck it. Um, they really do not want the current spike that comes out of that cap to go back that way. That's bad. That'll break it. Um, but for values less than, and I can't remember off the top of my head what it says in the data sheet, but for smaller values of caps, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, for smaller output voltages, you have to worry less about it. But oftentimes, you will see a diode 
like yay, right? So under normal conditions, this thing is reverse biased. And when power shuts off, it'll shunt the current up here. And oftentimes you'll see one like yay, because uh, it's got to go that way, doing the same thing, right? So basically this one discharges back here, this one discharges through there, da 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 da, and you save your regulator. Is that true? Yes, it's true. I've destroyed one doing that. Another thing you want to talk or you want to think about when you're doing this is uh, power dissipation. Okay, oftentimes this part uh, is like a TO220 package, which if you're not familiar with is maybe about the size of my finger, give or take, with three pins sticking out of it. I don't know about you guys, but I'm comfortable with one of those things. Without any heat sinking, I'm comfortable with that thing dropping about a half a watt. If it's more than that, I'm probably going to put a heat sink on it, because I tend to be paranoid where heat is concerned. And how easy is it to get to a half a watt? Well, if you've got, you know, uh, you, you've got at least one and three quarter volts, so you can't, as soon as you're drawing an amp, uh, you're less than that, half an amp or a little more, you're going to be dropping uh, a watt on this thing. So you, you need to think about power dissipation uh, when you set one of these up. So here is an LM317 circuit that I've had to deal with uh, recently for a project. It's a high voltage uh, regulator. I've got 415 volts in, and this is DC, and I've got 350 volts out. Okay, so I need to set this up. Uh, how we do it? Same way we did it before, the, the same equation applies, okay? Um, you know you've got 1.25 volts across this guy, and the data sheet will say, they, they specify, look, use 240 ohms, because it'll give you enough bias current to keep this thing stable. Um, so you, you pretty much, ought to, you don't have to, but yeah, I don't have a reason not to at the moment. So uh, you put that there, and you know what the current is through there, and you know what the voltage is here. If that's 350, this is 348.75. I had to calculate it twice, believe it or not. So 348.75 divided by 5.21, which is going through this guy, plus 50 microamps. And I calculated it both ways just to see what the difference is. Um, but doing it um, the, the, whole, the whole way with, with the I adjust, you get 66 302 ohms. Now I'm probably not gonna be able to find a resistor that's 66.302K. Um, but that's the number it came up with, and I, I might have to tweak that. Uh, oh, little note, don't use a pot in a circuit like this. And the reason is because after a while, sooner or later, after a number of years or whatever it's gonna take, the contact in the pot is gonna oxidize, okay? And that is effectively going to open up. And when that opens up, this voltage will go to this voltage. And so what's gonna happen to your stuff out there? Right, so watch that. Don't use a pot here for a high voltage circuit, just in case you want to do that. You also need to think about the power, right? I've got 348 volts across this guy at a not very trivial current. So you calculate it out and it's 1.83 watts. So you could get a two watt, but that wouldn't be smart. I tend to be really paranoid, and I said this before, I tend to be really paranoid about um, power and heat. Uh, I don't want the circuit to tank anytime soon. I want it to go forever. So I'm going to double that number. I'm probably going to go for like a 4 watt. You probably won't find a 4 watt, but you'll probably find a 5 watt. That's, and you might have to make something, right? Like I said, you can't use a pot, so I might have to gang up a whole bunch of resistors, and I might have to calculate power, blah, 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 blah. So let's talk about what's going on here. At max current, this thing is going to be driving 220 milliamps, okay? And if I didn't have all this other shtick going on here, that's 65 volts times 220 milliamps. So I've got, uh, what is that, 20-ish watts, give or take? Uh, it's a lot of power, okay? And I think this thing will not allow that much voltage. Uh, like, it'll have a max voltage uh, uh, rating that you cannot exceed between input and output. And I believe 65 volts is over the top. Uh, and certainly the 20 watts is probably not good either. So you'd have to heat sink the bejesus out of this thing. Effectively, what this is saying is you need someplace else to drop that power. That's where this guy comes in, okay? This is a big old NPN transistor that's rated for a lot of power. You see a 15 volt Zener diode, okay? So between the output and the base of this transistor is going to be 15 volts all the time, okay? So what does that mean for the rest of the circuit here? If this is effectively 365 volts, this point is 
0.7 volts less, give or take, but it's in the neighborhood, okay? You need to bias this thing so that it stays on and it's stable, okay? You know what the voltage is here, you know what the voltage is here, and you know you want about five milliamps, and it may, it may differ between data sheets and such. Uh, I just kind of picked five milliamps because I know that's gonna keep that thing on, whatever, whatever part I end up using. So I know I've got five milliamps going this way, and you've got uh, effectively 50 volts across this. Well, you calculate that out, and that value comes out to be 10K. This branch is going to be always drawing five milliamps. As long as that's 350 volts and that's 415, this is gonna be drawing five milliamps all the time. Now you also have to think about how much power this thing is gonna dissipate. And you do the, you calculate it out, and it actually comes out to um, a quarter watt. But, of course, you wanna double that, because this, this is, it's actually going to be a quarter watt dissipation all the time. Uh, so you'll at least want to double that. If I want 220 milliamps going out YAR, and I've got five going here, I know I've got to have um, at least, <laughs> and I haven't accounted for the bias current, this is, this is five milliamps in the neighborhood too. So this is probably going to be 225 total coming in here. But uh, for the sake of argument, because that's what I've calculated, uh, we're going to say that 215 milliamps is going that way. The way this thing works, right, you're going to have so much voltage across the LM317, right? That's, that's, the adjustable, that's the adjustable resistance. And this guy, what this guy is in here for is to shut it all down just in case the load starts drawing too much current, okay? So what happens? If that starts drawing too much current or a lot of current, the resistance in the LM317 is going to go down to allow more current but the voltage drop across this resistor is going to go up. When this voltage starts to increase, it starts to turn off that junction, which turns off the transistor, okay? So this is a protection thing. So you wanna calculate the value of this resistor. I know I've got, let's see, 15, so 365 minus 0.3, so there's 364.3 uh, volts at this point. Now, this is where dropout voltage for the regulator comes. The minimum dropout of this thing is 1.75 volts for it to be working. So you can take this voltage and subtract this voltage, or actually this voltage, right? Because yeah, this is going to be 1.75 higher than that. So this is uh, 364.3 minus um, 351.75. Uh, I got it written down in my notes as 12.55 volts that when this thing is full on and 215 milliamps is screaming through here, and remember, I forgot to account for the bias current, so some of these numbers might be a little wiggy, but the process is sound. It comes out to be 58 ohms. Now, what that means is that when, when all the current's going through, this is gonna drop 12.55 volts. If any more current goes through, the voltage goes up, starts to shut off, okay? So that I'm limiting right around 215 going through this branch. You need to consider power here as well because that much current and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it works out to be, and I got a couple of different calculations. So if you, if you go 12.55 volts times 215 milliamps, you get 2.7 watts. Again, double that for safety. So now let's talk about power dissipation of this guy, right? Because this has got 415, uh, 364.7. So you calculate out, and I got it, 415 minus 364.3 times 215 milliamps is 10.9 watts. In its normal state, I told you before, it was gonna draw about 190-ish mm, milliamps. So it's it won't be drawn, or it won't be dissipating 10.9 all the time, it'll be uh, dissipating a little bit less. Um, however, when, when designing a heat sink, this isn't the number I'm going to uh, design with. But under normal circumstances, it's going to draw 10, 11 watts. So this is definitely going to require a heat sink. A couple other things to add in here. Uh, decoupling cap at the inputs. Uh, this can usually be something like a 0.1. I know that we're all in the habit of putting ginormous electrolytic caps or tantalum caps. By the way, manufacturer loves tantalum caps. So if you stand on caps. Um, but this can be like a 0.1, and they'll tell you in data sheet, uh, you know, 0.1 is really about all you really need. Same thing for here. Protection diode, right? Um, because 
348.75 volts. I always got to run through that in my head. Uh, with, with that much, with even a 0.1, there's a lot of juice in that thing. So you do not want it going back that way. That'll pop your regulator. So you got to have this guy. Now, I confess, yes, there's another diode here that will forward bias, but I'm not totally clear on the return path here. Um, when this shuts off, you ideally want it to go right back to the output. And I don't really see that here, so this may be a bad design. Lastly in this circuit is this filter. We have cap, and the data sheet will always say, you don't really need more than about 10 microfarad. Depending, if it's, if it's tantalum, they'll tell you like, you know what, <laughs> you can get away with one microfarad. Uh, if it's electrolytic, uh, you got to jack it up to 25. In the designs that I've seen, that I've worked with, they have this sort of action. And it took me a while of digging to figure out what that was about. And uh, anybody who's more knowledgeable than, about this than I am can certainly chime in. My understanding is that the regulator, the LM317, becomes inductive at higher frequencies. The result is that if you have a big old cap sitting out here with a really low ESR, the output will start ringing at a certain frequency. Ringing, resonance between capacitance and inductance. I'm not sure that we've actually covered that. It's some wiggy stuff uh, and you definitely don't want it. So this resistor is in there to increase the ESR and suppress the ringing at certain higher frequencies. It also probably serves as as some amount of uh, protection, right? Since, uh, bah, 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 bah. since there's no obvious return path for the protection diode, uh, this might help to squash that a little bit. And I can also tell you, I suppose, that when this thing shuts off, the high voltage turns off, but there's still a load out there. So it'll probably discharge through the load. What happens when something bad happens here. What if I'm hovering over my project and I drop a screwdriver? This happens, believe me it happens. Uh, and this shorts to ground. Blam! Blam! Well, no, not necessarily. If you assume a wire down there, right? So this thing, this is gonna go to zero volts. This is still gonna be 15 volts. This spot, is gonna be, well, it's gonna be at 15 volts and you're gonna end up dropping 400 volts across that resistor. Ha 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 ha, okay. So now check this out. When I calculate the power for this thing, I don't use its quiescent state. I don't use the, the natural state. I use worst case scenario. What's gonna happen if I drop, you know, my forceps in the middle of this circuit and zack. So I'm gonna calculate that power accordingly. And this thing is gonna dissipate 16 watts. I'm probably not going to get a 32 watt resistor, but I will probably get something over 16 watts, right? If I drop something in the circuit, I'm gonna notice it right away and I'm gonna yank the power. Do not ever stick your hand in a high voltage circuit, but I'm gonna design so that this thing will not destroy itself if the worst happens. Um, same thing for this guy, right? Because you've got zero out there and you got 15 here, you're, you're effectively still gonna have that same voltage or, or at least the same difference of voltage from here to this point. So, so these things are actually going to be okay provided the catastrophe didn't happen with the LM370 to begin with. Worst case scenario, this thing is gonna be dropping um, Let's see, yeah, 400 volts at 215 milliamps. So this thing's got to dissipate 86 watts. Not trivial. So this needs some heat sink. Normally it's going to be this and that'll be just fine. Ideally, it'll never have to dissipate 86 watts for more than a couple of seconds. So it's probably going to be okay. But you can bet I'm going to beef up the heat sink just a little bit just in case I do something stupid like that. Other parts of consideration, this guy, right? This current is gonna go up to 40 milliamps, so this is going to drop 600 milliwatts. A, a one watt zener is a, a fairly simple thing to achieve, so that's not a big deal, but you definitely wanna plan. I would definitely wanna plan for that. And then there's this guy, except that the current is still going to be roughly 215-ish milliamps because this thing is still going to try to shut that off. Okay, so it's still going to limit the current. So the power rating on that guy shouldn't be a big deal. And of course, since this voltage is zero, all that stuff sort of drops out of the equation. But those are the things I think about when I deal with a circuit like this. Now, the other thing I will tell you is um, when I'm probing a circuit like this, high voltage, I do not ever put my hands, I am never holding a probe 
and touching a circuit that's live. I don't do that. Um, what I will do is I will set up a meter and I will take the probes and I will attach them to the places with the circuit down and then I will slowly bring the circuit up and I will watch what happens without touching anything. And that's basically it. Now I hope this didn't go too far over the line or too specific, too esoteric for the audience, but it kind of illustrates, this is a really, really versatile part. You can do a lot of things with it. And this just illustrates one thing, right? The, the setup is still the same, but there's all this other extraneous stuff that you can throw in there to make it fit your application, okay? And I, hopefully I gave you a few notes about uh, good design practice or, or maybe bad design practice, I don't know. That's uh, uh, linear voltage regulators, specifically the LM317 adjustable voltage regulator. Pretty cool part. Check out the data sheets because uh, you will find like a, a, a bajillion different circuits, uh, uh, different ways to set these things up for a lot of different applications. So thanks for watching. Uh, keep the questions in the comments coming. Uh, you can post them uh, either in the comment section below. I always do this because it's like I'm shooting the ground. Or you can send them to feedback at sparkfun.com with According to Pete in the subject line. Until next month, uh, thanks again and I'll see ya. Bye. I've been told I ain't right in the head.